Rod Dimock is going to um, share with us this morning. Um, he's um, blessing us all the way from just the other side of the hill there at, at the moment from, um, from Centre Church. So um, welcome, Rod. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and worship team for that beautiful worship. I might just shift this out a little bit. Otherwise, I can see myself tripping on that first step. Uh, but so good to be here in the presence of God with you and to worship. Thank you for that beautiful communion message. And uh, Margaret and I appreciate the opportunity. And hooray for Kids Church. Sorry, I said, I said now but not yet, and yet is now. So, all right. Thank you, kids. Sorry, Rod. No worries. Yeah, we're used to an exodus before the message. And we don't want to suffer the little children. We don't want little children to suffer. They will enjoy children's church. God bless them. But it's, uh, yeah, wonderful to be here with you. Uh, and I appreciate Pastor Allen on the Lismore Ministers Fellowship Executive. Uh, and he just makes a great contribution there. And in fact, this church... Uh, hosting quite a number of our uh, quarterly combined church services and I love the name of this church Arise and I just see have this picture of Jesus saying to the disciples Arise let us let us get going and so just a, an action faith initiative name because I believe God's calling all of us to arise in faith in these days and uh, Jackie uh, has just started work at in the Summerland office, front office there, Summerland Christian College, and we appreciate her contribution uh, there as well, and both of them uh, as leaders, church leaders in our city. Our city has been through so much uh, between COVID and the worst flood ever and another flood, massive flood a month later. And But I believe amidst all the suffering and heartache and pain, there's a fresh openness to God and a fresh opportunity for us, for us as the church of our Lord Jesus Christ to step forward, to arise, dare I say, and to seize the opportunities around us. Uh, Margaret and I are enjoying semi-retirement. Uh, we're ridiculously busy in semi-retirement, but it's great. Uh, by the grace of God, I handed over Centre Church to Pastor Dave Winter on the 31st of December, before the massive flood, said a year and a half ago, uh, and Pastor Dave doing an excellent job of leading the reconstruction of Centre Church downtown and the leading of the church along with the team. Uh, so, yes, we're just working, I'm working part time. Margaret gets called in for the teaching, lots of casual teaching at Summerland, and we're blessed with. Uh, a whole bunch of grandchildren. We've got five children and 12 grandchildren and minding grandkids is the greatest. Uh, exhausting, but fun. So uh, let's just get into this message. Have you ever had a vision? I wouldn't exactly define it as a vision, but some years back I was just in prayer and I got this kind of heavenly scene in the imagination of my mind and it was like this enormous uh, amphitheater and thousands upon thousands of people we were all gathered there uh, and there was such a sense of anticipation and excitement in the air and on this uh, wonderful stage this magnificent person stepped forward and was all set to conduct the worship singing and we realised it was the Holy Spirit, this magnificent person. And as he lifted his hand, this mighty roar of praise and appreciation uh, echoed around this vast uh, auditorium, heavenly uh, amphitheatre. And then the Holy Spirit pointed and Jesus was on the stage. And this enormous roar of praise and, th and then the Holy, uh, Jesus pointed to God the Father. And it was just electric. It was, you know, shivers down the spine kind of stuff. And I've never forgotten that. It was just like this little glimpse, uh, just in the imagination of my mind, of what awaits us in heaven. 
And if you've had a vision of some sort or even a picture like that, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? God bless you, because I want to share about a vision that a man had back in the pages of our Old Testament, and his name was Ezekiel. Ezekiel means God strengthens. And Ezekiel was a prophet of God uh, during the uh, time that the Jews were in Babylon. So he'd been carried captive with thousands of others in 597 BC in the seconds of three deportations uh, of the people of Judah across to the conquering nation of Babylon. And he was probably in his mid-twenties when he went there and a few years later he started his prophetic ministry, probably about age 30, over there in Babylon and the captives there are starting to reassemble their lives and uh, starting to recover from the trauma they've been through. And he's prophesying and he's prophesying the big picture that God will deal with the nations that have conquered and so on uh, and that God will restore his people and God's agenda will power on and God will have his way and he sees this river and I want to share about this this morning the river of God and in his this vision he just sees this river flowing from the temple uh, and out and he describes it in Ezekiel 47. Uh, let me read here, uh, verse 1, then he brought me, that's the angelic uh, messenger to the prophet Ezekiel, he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. Uh, for the front of the temple faced east, the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway it faces east and there was water running out on the right side uh, then when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand he measured 1000 cubits and he brought me through the waters the water came up to my ankles again he measured 1000 and brought me through the waters the water came up to my knees Again, he measured 1,000, brought me through the river, through the water, the, uh, brought me through, sorry, the water came up to my waist. And he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned, then there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Uh, verse 11, but its swamps and marshes will not be healed for they will be given over to salt. Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. I believe God's moving afresh in these days. I sense there is a fresh stirring uh, of the Holy Spirit and lives are being transformed as God pours out his spirit afresh. And even though we've been through so much disaster and trauma, uh, I believe that generally there's a greater openness to God and opportunity for us as the church and we're seeing the touch of God upon young people in these days uh, over at Summerland young people gathering for prayer and youth groups coming together for worship and young people opening up to God getting filled with the spirit baptized in water and God I believe is stirring afresh the river of God is flowing afresh I love that scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah 43 verses 18 and 19. 
uh, where God says, Behold, I do a new thing. Even now shall it spring forth. I will make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And it's in the desert times of our lives that we most appreciate the life-giving flow of the Spirit of God. It's in those times of need, of difficulty, of deprivation that we most appreciate God's provision, God's love, his grace. When our prayers sometimes don't seem to be answered and there's barrenness all around there and God releases that river, that river of comfort and grace and strength and wisdom in the aridity of the desert that we appreciate the power, the mighty power of God uh, the mighty power of God's river. And the river speaks of God's healing, God's love, God's grace, God's power flowing. And it's the river that brings fruitfulness, that transforms lives, that brings glory to God. And I believe there's a fresh flowing of this mighty river of God all around us in these days. And so uh, here we read in the book of Ezekiel, uh, of this great river of God, I believe it speaks of the mighty, ever-growing purpose of God down through history. Uh, it speaks of the unfolding revelation of God uh, through the Old Testament, bringing us to Jesus. I believe it's a picture of the Christian life and the journey of faith and the growth and development of our faith, our journey uh, with God, uh, right from the door of the temple where we first become a Christian. And God leads us increasingly into his deeper purposes and we experience his blessing. And so I just want to encourage you this morning that there is a river flowing and it's a magnificent, heavenly, mighty, all-powerful river. It's the river of God. It's the moving of his Holy Spirit in these days. And we need to step into it. We need to uh, take up our courage and boldness and launch into God's mighty river and waters to swim in and we need to uh, surrender to God's purpose uh, in these days. So the river is the river of the Holy Spirit and the river of the unfolding of the word of God. So in Ephesians 5 it talks about Christ cleansing the church by the washing of water with the word and the river of God cleanses us through the truths of his word as we study the scriptures and allow his word to wash over us there is a cleansing power the river also speaks of the Holy Spirit because Jesus uh, when the uh, Jews were gathered for the feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem uh, and the great water jar pouring ceremony was underway and Jesus called out if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink. Uh, for uh, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit, whom they had not yet received, because the Spirit had not yet been given. And so that was in Jesus' time, and he was speaking of the Holy Spirit's outpouring, which was to happen shortly after uh, his crucifixion, and resurrection. So I just want you to have a think about uh, these stages, uh, these dimensions of experiencing God that we're all called to as believers and the opportunities we have to serve him and to be a witness in these days. So I want you to do some steps. Okay, I'm a bit kind of, I have this watch that clocks my steps. And I just am a bit, uh, what's the word, a bit of a nerd about it because 5,000 steps is my minimum. I know it's pitiful for anyone who's up on their feet working hard, you know, 10, 15,000, you clock up. For me, 5,000 is the minimum. And if I haven't done 5,000 uh, by night time, I go walking up and down the street outside in the dark and I'm watching. Oh, 5,000, I can go to bed now. <laughs> what is that word? There's a word for it. Anyhow. Obsessed, that's it, yeah. <laughs> so I want you to do some steps with me this morning. Steps of faith, because we're going to just 
walk along imagining the angelic messenger and Ezekiel the prophet following him along the river of God. But first of all, let me just say it all starts at the door of the temple. Uh, Jesus said in John 10 that he was the door of the sheep and if anyone doesn't enter through him, they're thieves and robbers and no gooders. But he is the door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's on the basis of Jesus' uh, incredibly sacrificially loving self-sacrifice on the cross uh, that where he paid the penalty for all our waywardness and then his triumphant resurrection from the dead on the basis of his redemptive work that we can come to him and through Jesus the door of the sheepfold to become God's sheep, to come into God's family, to be God's kids in the heavenly palace, to inherit all the goodness of God by his grace. And it is by his grace. It's not our own efforts, our own you know, cleverness or knowledge or hard works. In fact, it says in Ephesians 2, then it's by grace through faith we've been saved. Not as a result of works that anyone should boast. But verse 10 goes on to say, for we are God's workmanship, uh, I love the version that says we're God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has ordained beforehand for us to walk in. So we enter through the doorway and we come into God's family and we step into the greatest adventure of all, the Christian life and God's unfolding plan and purpose of goodness and love and grace and his genius plan for us unfolds as we follow the river of his purpose of his word of his spirit so the first uh, little walk we've got to do about 750 steps uh, which was about 500 meters a thousand cubits cubit was the longer cubit in the hebrew times was about a half meter so okay there's the angelic messenger and prophet ezekiel and off they go 1,000 cubits, 500 metres, 750 steps. We're going to clock up about 3,000 steps here this morning. And they uh, get to the part of the river where it crosses and it's ankle deep. Ankle deep water. So what's this talking about? I believe this is talking about learning to walk with God. Where we're just really learning to take those initiatives of faith, learning to trust God, learning foundational truths of scripture, and we're starting to walk with Father, just like a little child learning to walk with their parents. And we've had so much fun with grandkids just in recent times, seeing them learning to walk. We had one, we've got one little fellow on the Gold Coast, Django is his name, Django, D-J-A-N-G-O, our kids and spouses, where do they get these names from? And he learnt to crawl, even before he could walk, he learnt to crawl and he could crawl so fast. And uh, last summer at the beach, uh, a few times we had him there and you'd like turn around to say something, someone you and he's just crawling so fast, headlong into the crashing waves and we'd have to quickly run and people glaring at us as though we're delinquent grandparents and swoop him up before the wave crashed. It's totally fearless. Totally fearless, totally trusting whoever was minding him. But that's a, it's a wonderful stage of the Christian life where we're learning to walk with God. I mean, then he learned to walk and that was even more interesting. Uh, but it's like we reach up and take Heavenly Father's hand and learn to take those steps of exciting faith. So 1,000 cubits, if we think of, say, it representing 1,000 years. Now, did you know that the seventh descendant of Adam died about 1,000 years after Adam came on the scene, if you look at the ages? Uh, and the seventh from Adam, his name was Enoch. Enoch. And the fascinating thing is, he didn't just live and die like all the others. It says... Uh, he walked with God. The only one, who, apart from Noah, who says, that says of him, he walked with God and he was not, for God took him. This man had such a close relationship with God 
that is strolling with God, I can imagine, conversing about the things of life, and one day God says, just keep coming with me, Enoch, and let him straight into heaven. What a picture of walking with God. Now, I like maths, and it's just interesting. Interesting, I wouldn't build a church on this, but interesting that Enoch, how old was he when he was translated into heaven? Because all the other ones there, you know, 900 and... 30 years, I think there was Adam and all the 800 massive ages. In fact, Enoch's son was the oldest one who ever lived, was Methuselah, and he lived 969 years. But Enoch, 365 years, and God took him. That says to me, we should walk with God 365 days a year. Every day of our life. Now, sure, I wouldn't build a church, but interesting, isn't it? Mathematical coincidence. I think there's a message there for us. So God calls us to walk with him, to step out in faith. I think of that lame man in the temple, at the entrance to the temple, and Peter and John, after God healed this man through Peter and John's ministry, he went walking and leaping and praising God. What a privilege to walk with God. What a, an honour to be able to share our lives, our daily uh, adventures with God himself, to walk like a child with father, with mother, a child with a parent, walking the journey of life. So then we come to the next section. We're learning, we've learnt to step out in faith. Sure, we may stumble, but remember, it says in the Psalms, uh, the Psalms, the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. Though they fall, they shall arise. Even when we trip, we stumble like a little kid, get up again, bounce back. Bounce back quickly. I may be saying that to someone even here today. God wants you to get up, bounce back, go on, rebound into the fullness of his purpose because he loves you and his grace is upon you. Uh, okay, so then there's uh, knee-deep water, all right? We've gone another 750 steps. So we're now up to 2,000 cubits, 2,000 years. And who came along around about 2,000? So Adam was about 4,000 BC. Uh, so Enoch translated around 3,000 BC. We're now up to 2,000 BC if we're taking a cubit as a year. And the Bible is full of imagery, let's face it, anyhow. This is what we're basically working on. Uh, 2000 BC was Abraham. And how deep are the waters? So we walked up and we crossed the river again, following the angelic messenger. Knee deep. Knee deep. They reckon the apostle James had knees like a camel because he was on his knees so much in prayer. Now we don't often tend to get on our knees to pray, but... I believe the knee-deep waters speak of learning to pray, learning to trust God, learning to ask God, learning to get help from God, learning to pray. Knee-deep waters. And so we're walking with God and things happen. We quickly learn that we need to get into prayer and to trust God. So Abraham was about 2000 BC and there's a whole section there which records... Uh, Abraham's prayerful intercession for the city of Sodom and just his, his heartfelt uh, prayer and intercession uh, for that city that was uh, filled with wickedness. Uh, and so God calls us to pray, to pray for our world, to pray for salvation of those around us, to pray for relatives, to pray for friends, to be people of prayer. And when you look in the book of Acts, the early church, boy, did they know how to pray. They didn't pray self-centered prayers. They were suffering persecution. And they'd pray, not like I would have prayed, Lord, protect us, don't let the temple police come and get us again. And They prayed, Lord, grant us boldness that we may fulfill your word and your promises may come to you. They prayed bold prayers. And there in Acts 4 we read, the place was shaken, the prayer meeting, the structure was physically shaken because of the power of God. And so as this mighty swirling, these wonderful waters of the river of God wrap around our lives, we find ourselves slipping to our knees in prayer. 
Now, there's so many different angles on prayer and I don't want to take too much time on this, but let me mention 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Sometimes people say, oh, I wish I knew what God's will was. Well, here's three things that will probably take you the rest of your life to fulfil God's will. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. First one, rejoice always. Oh, what a challenge. You know, James says in the book of James, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. You've got to be kidding. That's supernatural faith, isn't it? Rejoice always. Then he says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. What? My mouth's going to go dry. I'm going to run out of words very quickly. But I believe it's talking about a, an attitude of trust and dependence, a hard attitude of prayerfulness before God. And prayer really is the expression, the ongoing expression of our voluntary dependence upon God. And so pray without ceasing in everything, give thanks. It goes on to say, verse 18, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So the next time we're asking God to show us his will, Let's just check we're doing those three foundational ones. A good springboard to spring from in prayer. So Abraham was a man with relationship with God, a man of prayer. Uh, God calls us to be people of prayer. The poet, Tennyson I think it was, said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Prayer changes nations. Elijah, remember after his victorious battle with the idolatrous idolatrous um, priest of the day on Mount Carmel. Uh, he goes away and he prays. He's praying for rain. The nation had been in drought for three and a half years. And Elijah prays and rain falls and the nation uh, knows that God is real. God is the true God. But it says there in James 5 where it says... The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. It goes on to quote Elijah and his nation-impacting prayer, but it also has this phrase, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Isn't that comforting? I mean, Elijah, sure, he's phenomenal, but a little bit later in the scripture, we see, see him running like a scared rabbit from Queen Jezebel slumping into deep depression, hiding in a cave. So I think, wow, Elijah had his human frailties as well. There's hope for us all. Elijah with a nature like ours and he prayed these nation-changing prayers. So let's make sure we learn to pray and experience the knee-deep waters of the mighty river of God. So then we go another 750 steps and what do we come to? The angelic messenger leads across the river this time. Wow, it's getting deep. It's waist deep. By the way, there no, don't seem to be any tributaries feeding this river. This is God. This is a God thing. This is a sovereign plan and purpose of God, the outpouring of his spirit and his grace. And as we journey by faith through life, the waters get deeper. We learn the deeper things of God. We experience God in deeper ways and it's exciting and by this stage 3,000 cubits we've got the waters swirling around the core of our being and I believe this speaks of really gaining strength and giving uh, God priority in the central issues of life core strength in God now 3,000 years who does that bring us to from Adam we went to Enoch than to Abraham and so we're now at a thousand BC and if you know the biblical timeline good old David David was round about a thousand BC David had strength he had amazing strength for battle he knew how to stand to stand in faith and see God win battles uh, he loved God he was a man with a heart after God, again, sure he had his failings and some pretty bad ones, but God loved him and helped him at every step of the way. He, it's like he had God, he put God central in his life 
uh, and he just had that core strength uh, to really stand for God when it mattered. And God is wanting to make us strong, strong to stand for him, uh, strong to see victories in his name, uh, strong in our priorities and our decisions, strong to follow Jesus. And Jesus is wanting us as his disciples to be people of integrity. Uh, scripture in Ephesians there talking about the armour of God says our loins girt with truth. So where righteousness grips us in the centre of our being and we are dedicated to God and we learnt stability and strength to be able to stand. Because if you step into a river and there's a strong current, you need strength to stand once the water's waist deep. Uh, we got one of those old tractor tyres some years back, an inflated tractor tyre, and we used to, I used to take it in the surf in the waves with the kids. It was so much fun. And the kids would cling on to it and I'd hang on to it. I remember one time at Pottsville Beach there was this massive rip. I remember just hanging on and bracing myself for all I was worth. A couple of our kids hanging on. I said, don't let go. You just hang. And this rip kind of rushing past. And thankfully, I just had enough strength to, to hold it. Else we would have all gone on an unplanned uh, excursion out into the depths of the Pacific. But to be able to stand when the tumultuous uh, circumstances of life the swirling all around us or God is doing powerful things and to be able to, to uh, stand and experience God in the midst of everything. Waste deep water. We're called to serve God. Uh, in fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 at the end of the chapter, after saying, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ because God wants us to be strong to stand in battle having done everything to stand, it goes on to say, uh, be steadfast, immovable. Okay, that's strength. Be steadfast, immovable, uh, always serving the Lord. Be steadfast, uh, immovable, abounding in serving the Lord. And so God calls us to serve him, to be witnesses, to be strong, and that's the waist deep water. So that brings us to the fourth one, which is the waters to swim in, another 750 steps, another 1,000 cubits, 4,000 cubits from Adam now, 4,000 years, brings us to Jesus. Jesus and the whole dating system is based on Jesus coming, isn't it? Brings us to, into AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So uh, by this stage, the waters are so deep you can no longer keep touch on earth. You just have to swim. You just got to immerse yourself and surrender yourself into the water, into God's purposes, into God's plan. And God loves that. That's just wholehearted abandonment to God uh, in his love, to his purpose, in his grace. And Jesus came to bring the new covenant. And that then gives us the opportunity to just fully abandon ourselves in faith to following Jesus with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, uh, and to surrender to God's will. Now, some people are scared of God's will. I used to be as a young man, but I came to learn that God's will is the best thing that could ever happen to you. Romans 12, 2, uh, that you may prove, uh, well, the do not be conformed to this world. So we've got to let go of our feet on the ground, in the water. It's too deep now. We've got to swim. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God loves us. He knows the details of our lives. He wants the best for us. My wife and I were reminded of God's care about the details of our lives uh, recently, earlier this year actually, when we had enjoyed a holiday in Tasmania and we were leaving to return home and our little granddaughter, uh, Freya, was turning one. We knew as soon as we got back we had her birthday party and we were trying to find a birthday present for her. 
So we found a toy shop and Margaret was looking around and I was looking at the prices and kind of got scared and left the shop. <laughs> Beautiful toys but, you know, <laughs> tourist prices. Uh, anyhow, I wandered into a gift shop and then Margaret managed to graciously escape the other shop and <laughs> said, come have a look in here because I'd seen up on a shelf some, some dolls. So we came in and looked, oh, perfect, got the damn price tag, perfect, you know, reasonable value. And we're on our way to buy this little do this doll for our precious granddaughter Freya. Margaret says, there's a name tag on it. She turned it over and guess what it said? Freya. Freya. Now, if that's not God interested in the details of this precious little granddaughter's life, uh, and just a reminder to us, what is? And God is interested in the details. Let's face it, the hairs of a head are numbered. That's an ongoing reducing tally in my case. And God, we can fully dive into the waters to swim in and abandon ourselves to God in love and worship and obedience because God has our best interests at heart. So just uh, looking at the few verses that follow, just a comment on the outcomes. So where did this river lead? Wherever this river went, there were trees along the bank. There was fruitfulness. The river flowed into the Dead Sea back there, the lowest point on earth, uh, and it brought life. And fish started to swarm, and there's fishermen there. Fishing's going on. Uh, the waters brought healing. Uh, and then the trees along the banks, as you read there, uh, had fruit, food, uh, and the leaves were for healing, for medicine, it says. The fr their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. And this mighty river brings such transformation from barrenness to fruitfulness, from death to life. Fish, speaking of evangelism, I'm looking forward to the day when multitudes are swept into God's kingdom way beyond what we see. We rejoice at the ones we lead in the salvation prayer and have the joy of baptizing and so on. But when multitudes, because Jesus told his disciples to be fishers of people, and there I believe we're going to see in the coming days a great in gathering, multitudes getting saved, lives transformed, healing flowing, provision, uh, people growing in their faith, becoming strong, and all of us, uh, as we just follow this river and keep uh, immersed in the purpose of God, we're going to see great blessing. There is one warning, and it says, uh, it's swamps and marshes will not be healed, they will be given over to salt. How sad. So the swamp is what knew the flow of the mighty river. But it got shallow, it got stagnant, it stopped moving and it became a swamp. As it got drier, it became a marsh. May we never stop following the river. May we never withdraw. May we never go shallow on God. May we never just kind of step back and step out. But as we step in, and I believe God's calling us to step in further, to step in deeper, to step in with a greater boldness, to experience God more than ever, to be available to him, to flow in his purpose, to bear fruit, uh, to go fishing as witnesses for him in these days. We're going to see the river level rise. And this, of course, is the good river, not the bad river that brings devastation, the good river that brings healing and, and blessing and grace and provision and victory and we're going to see the river of God flowing more strongly all around us than ever I believe and God's saying to us will you step in deeper will you uh, immerse yourself in my purpose will you not backtrack but step forward step forward in faith and yield and surrender afresh to me and I believe we'll be surprised at the great things we see God doing all around us I wonder if we could stand as we pray I just wanted to do a simple action here, an action of faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the challenges of your word, your truth.
Thank you for the call of your Holy Spirit to our minds and hearts in these days. Thank you that you're calling us to step forward into deeper places in you, uh, to yield in a greater way to the flow of your purpose, to be open, Lord, to be used of you for your fruitfulness to flow and to use us as witnesses uh, to see transformed lives in these days. And Lord, we just want to say we want to step more deeply into the great mighty river of your purpose and your blessing, the unfolding of your goodness in these days. And Lord, I'd just like you to ask you to do this simple action with me, whatever space you have around you, to take one step, one step forward. And Lord Jesus, we're just going to do this symbolic step of faith right now here in your presence as an indication that we want to, we want to, we desire to go deeper in you and to flow in a greater way in your purpose that we might see greater fruit in these days. Can you just take one step forward in whatever space you have? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you see. You see our heart desire, our response to flow with you, to go with you, to experience you, to share you, to minister for you, to witness unto you. In these days, Lord, as your river increases all around us, and we thank you in advance for great, great fruitfulness. Just as we stay bowed in prayer, if there's anyone here today who just needs to make a recommitment to follow Jesus, maybe you've just sort of been dabbling in the water a bit and stepping to and fro, or maybe you've never personally, decisively asked Jesus to be your Lord and Saviour, would you please pray this prayer sincerely in your heart right now? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you went to the cross and paid the penalty for my sins. I thank you you rose again from the dead and you offer me the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. And today I declare you in my heart, in my life, as my Lord and Saviour, and I make a choice to follow you. And I ask for the power of your Holy Spirit that I may flow in the great river of your goodness. In your name, Lord Jesus, I ask this. Amen.